Rush Limbaugh passes away at the age of 70 from lung cancer. Texas is a mess, and the left can't get can't just let a good tragedy go to waste. But they really sound stupid once we look at the statistics. And Trump lays into Mitch McConnell. This is Gene, and you're listening to Dumbasses Talking Politics. Hey, hey, this is Gene. Welcome back to Dumbasses Talking Politics. Well, Joe Biden had a uh, had a town hall on um, yesterday on CNN, and it was really funny. Uh, but there are some other things I'd rather talk about, uh, and I got to cut video audio for that. But let's 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 look at uh, let's take a look at what's happening in the world. Uh, Rush Limbaugh, who without a doubt had a huge influence on conservative media, um, has passed away of lung cancer at the age of 70. Uh, he just announced two weeks ago that he was probably not going to come back to the radio. I believe this was in um, February 5th or something. Uh, was his last contest, uh, last contact in the radio. Um, Limbo's wife, Catherine, uh, made the announcement on his radio show. Losing a loved one is a terrible is terribly difficult, even more so when that loved one is larger than life. Rush will be forever will be will forever be the greatest of all time. Uh, January 2020 was diagnosed with um, stage four lung cancer. He actually lasted quite a bit longer than they thought he would. Uh, which just shows you the strength of the guy. Uh, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Trump during the State of the Union address in January of 2020. Millennia Trump actually presented him with the medal while he was sitting in the audience at the um, at the State of the Union address. Uh, he is considered probably the most influential figure on conservative politics. Uh, Fox News has even said today that probably half the reason there is a Fox News is because of Rush Limbaugh. Uh, many other conservative outlets, such as the Epic Times, the Wall Street Journal, um, uh, the Daily Wire, Blaze Television, they all basically just gave him gave him kudos that half the reason they're around is because of him. Uh, his program began about 33 years ago, and it was it nationally syndicated. Uh, it was on, ended up only on, with national syndication, this is something, it only ended up on 56 actual radio stations. Uh, when it had finished, um, it was on 600 different radio stations. 27 million people a week turned in to actually listen to Rush Limbaugh. Um, here in his final broadcast, this was just a couple of weeks ago, is his statement about leaving uh, broadcasting. It was very emotional, and it's just it's really tough to watch something like this. Especially for a guy, 70 is not old. It's just, it's hard. My point in all of this today is gratitude. My, my point in everything today that I share with you about this is to say thanks and to tell everybody involved how much I love you from the bottom of a sizable and growing and still beating heart. I wasn't expected to be alive today. You have an expiration date. A lot of people never get told that, and so they they um, don't face life this way. I've learned what love really is during this. Now, I've never really listened to a lot of Rush Limbaugh, uh, because at the time when he was most popular, he seemed a little bit too conservative for me. But my dad uh, loved him. My dad listened to him constantly, and so I did listen to him indirectly. And a lot of the things he said didn't sound all that crazy. Um, he sounded actually pretty normal. Um, 
he's going to be missed, and there's definitely going to be a hole when it comes to conservative radio. Now, let's get, get into this mess in Texas. First thing, let's talk about what happened. Um, the temperatures throughout the country have absolutely been plummeting. Uh, we're looking at another one of those, what do they call it, um, polar vortexes system. 74% of the country now is suffering through freezing weather. Uh, but Texas is being hit the hardest. One of the reasons they're being hit the hardest is because they're not used to six degree temperatures, which is what is actually happening even in southern Texas, in the areas that are bordering Mexico. So needless to say, um, power is needed to heat homes and the power spiked and the entire power grid went down. Um, so far, uh, as of right now, it's been four days since the, uh, since the frigid temperatures and the power being fluctuating at best. And as of this writing, 17 people have been known to have died. Um, they're thinking there's probably more that are going to be found. A lot of the deaths have to do with, um, a lot of the deaths have to do with, uh, using other forms of heat. For example, they are using, some people are actually using cars. They're turning on their cars and opening their garage doors. So the, the exhaust from the cars can heat the house. Very bad idea, but that is what's happening. People are burning coal furniture furnaces and the coal furnaces is creating like the cars is creating a lot of, um, carbon monoxide and that's killing people. Some people are just flat out freezing. Uh, people in Texas have to actually, because there's no power, um, a lot of water filtration systems are frozen up. And so they have to actually heat their water in order to make sure all the bacteria within the water is killed. What's happening now is, uh, what's happening uh, the last couple of days, now um, the water pipelines are beginning to freeze. So people are having water problems. They're having trouble getting water. It's an absolute mess. Now, the company that deals with uh, 90% of the power that is generated in Texas is from a company called ERCOT. Texas governor uh, Greg Abbott is just livid. He doesn't understand what has happened. And so he wants to set up an investigation and if he has to, he wants people fired or he wants people thrown in jail for what is happening to the citizens of Texas. Um, this is what Greg Abbott said, uh, quote, this is a total failure by ERCOT. ERCOT stands for Electric Reliability Council of Texas, and they showed that they were not reliable. These are not specialists. These are specialists, and government has to rely upon these specialists to be able to deliver in these types of situations. Okay, yes and no. Um, it's true. Uh, this is bad. People are going to die. People are going to have to lose their jobs in this thing because this was a mess. But we also have to remember it's been 100 years since a polar vortex like this has hit Texas. And Texas never really... Their infrastructure, their power infrastructure was never really set up for this. So I know this is a lot of talk, and I know that Greg Abbott, Governor Abbott, is feeling the pressure, but I, I think we need to do these investigations, see what happened, and then fix some of the issues, because there were a lot of issues. Now, one of the things the Democrat, the left can't do is they, they just can't let a good disaster go to waste. They have got to use it. They have to politicize it. We're talking probably between 50 and 100 people are going to be dead after this whole thing. But you can't, and you can't, right now there are 17 dead. You can't worry about that if you're on the left. You have to not worry about the people because the left doesn't care about the people. You have to politicize this thing. You have to make a big freaking stink out of it. And that's what our famous Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did right off the bat. What did she blame? She blamed the fact that there uh, is climate change and the fact that Texas does not have green energy. This is what she tweeted. Week on sweep, 
Weak on sweeping next-gen public infrastructure investments. Little focus on equity so communities are left behind. Climate deniers in leadership so they don't get don't long prep for disaster. We need to help people now. Long term, we must realize there are consequences for inaction. The infrastructure failures in Texas are quite literally what happens when you don't pursue a Green New Deal. Um, she was basically called out immediately uh, by several people. One is Eric Erickson, uh, and I think he pretty much pretty much summed it up. And we're going to talk about this because I think this is important. Eric Erickson tweeted, "Yes, the snow-covered solar panel panels and frozen wind term and froze wind turbines would have been so much." Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the snow-covered solar panels and frozen wind turbines would have been so much more effective by themselves. Okay, here, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. First off, um, this is this is not known, but the power outages were caused. The infrastructure crashing were caused by a bunch of things. It wasn't just that solar and wind weren't used, or it was something like that. There were lots of problems. Um, coal and natural gas lines froze. So I, I think it's about 70%. I'd have to do the math. I think uh, I, I think it's 60 some odd percent of the energy in Texas is based off of coal and natural gas. The lines flow, the lines froze. They weren't temperature protected and the the power stopped. Okay. Um, they do have two nuclear reactors in Texas, all right? The nuclear reactors, for the most part, didn't have a problem. There was a problem with one reactor that actually had a, an emergency sensor that froze, and then it went off, shutting down the nuclear reactor. But the nuclear reactor, reactors for themselves are, are less than 10% of the power. So the nuclear, and by the way, I'm, I'm still not quite understanding why we're not nu using nuclear. I, I think, I think nuclear is the cleanest, believe it or not, it is the safest compared to gas, coal, or, or solar panels or windmills. It is the safest form of en an energy source and the cleanest form of energy source. Contrary to popular belief, um, windmills are actually really heavy. In Texas, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that says windmill power is about 42 percent of the power in Texas. I don't. I think it's a lot less. I think it's in the 20s. But they do have windmill farms in Texas, and there are certain sections of Texas that actually 50 percent of their energy actually comes from windmills. Um, these windmills died. They the cold went out there. The windmills froze. And they're not moving. There are pictures of them all over the place. And finally, the solar panels, which there are, there's a lot of solar panels. Solar, solar panels don't make up a lot of electricity, but they do make up some. Um, they're at zero. Uh, the solar panels actually froze. Um, they've got nothing but frost on them. They're not absorbing any sun. There is no sun over there right now. So there's like, I, I hate I hate to be not negative or cynical, but there is 0%. And I mean literally from ERCOT itself, 0% uh, power coming from uh, solar panels. But uh, what what the left is really forgetting is most of uh, Texas actually generates the most power from wind technology than any state in the union. That includes California. OK, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal and this person, I, I can't remember the name. It's the politi politization. Uh, it's a, an article by um, the editorial board. They don't have one person. The political making of a Texas power outage. How bad energy policy led to rolling blackouts in the freezing load star state. Actually, pretty much summed it up. Uh, listen to what they said. Quote, the problem in Texas, oh, problem is Texas's over-reliance on wind power that has left the grid more vulnerable 
to bad weather. Half of wind turbines froze last week, causing wind's share of electricity to plunge to 8% from 42%. Power prices in wholesale markets spiked, and grid, reg- grid regulators on Friday warned of rolling blackouts. Natural gas and coal generators ramped up to cover the supply gap, but couldn't meet the surging demand for electricity, which half of the households on rely on for heating. Even as many families powered up their gas furnaces, even though many families powered up their gas furnaces, Then some gas wells and pipelines froze. In short, there wasn't sufficient baseload power from coal and nuclear to support the grid. Baseload power is needed to stabilize grid frequency amid changes in demand and supply. When there's not enough baseload power, the grid gets unbalanced and the power sources can fail. The more the grid relies on intermittent renewables like wind and solar, the more baseload power is needed to back them up. So here's the thing. Baseload power basically means is this is the minimum we need to keep afloat. And what this article is complaining about is that we are relying on a lot of power in Texas coming from wind and from solar to make up that base load and they want to push away and they, Texas has been doing this they want to push back on oil and natural gas and of course why anyone's not using nuclear nuclear would be the thing here if you could create if you created enough nuclear uh, reactors you could actually create your base load only with just um, uh, nuclear energy it, it, it's very clean very safe all right, I know we hear about Chernobyl, which for some reason Russia is not technologically in our boat. And we hear about Three Mile Island, which actually wasn't quite as bad as they made it out to be. It's actually very, very safe. As a matter of fact, nuclear uh, supposedly is the, the power resource that kills less people than other, uh, other resources, including gas, coal, uh, even solar and wind. And I'm not a big fan of solar and wind, uh, of uh, solar and wind. Wind it kills birds left and right. Solar kills birds left and right. It also does a ton of damage because of the heat they emit. And those those fans, yeah, they just they just chop up birds like it's going out of style. So there's a lot of problems with this stuff. Now, here's the thing: How do you prove this? How do you make you actually do something weird? You look at statistics. ERCOT actually released statistics from um, to the public. And these statistics show what they expect, what they, uh, what they expect dependably, what um, they and what actually happened and how much of a loss each resource had. Coal, gas, solar, wind and nuclear. So let's take a look at these stats. So coal was down 63%. Dependable energy that coal is meant to make up is 13,630 gigawatts. What they produced on the 15th of February was 8,616 megawatts. So that's only 63% of what they make. Uh, gas, the dependable gas is 52,523 gigawatts of dependable energy. They produced on the 15th 32,108 gigawatts. That is only 61% of capacity. So right off the bat, gas and coal were down, for, were down 37, 38%. That's bad. But here's... Here's here's the one I love to see. Nuclear power produces 5,153 dependable gigawatts of energy, and during the during the crash, it produced 4,140 uh, gigawatts. So it was only it was only down 20 percent. It was that's basically 80 percent of expected capacity of dependable energy. So nuclear 
And of course, it, the reason they lost that thousand gigawatts is simply because one of the one of the uh, 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 one of the reactors went down due to a faulty emergency switch. And by the way, a faulty emergency switch shuts down a uh, reactor. That's good. It means that the reactor's safe. So I'm not quite sure what it. Now we get into the weird one. Dependable energy from wind is 7,070 gigawatts. That's it. 7,070 gigawatts. On the 15th, we're over half the solar, uh, half the windmills went down. It only produced 3,153 gigawatts, bringing it down a whopping 55%. It was only 45% of capacity. So I want to ask AOC, out of curiosity, where does she get the idea that, oh, well, if they had, if they had wind, there'd be no problem? Because I don't know about you, I'm not seeing it. Finally, solar, which is a disaster. Dependable energy is 304 gigawatts. On the 15th, solar produced zero gigawatts. Zero gigawatts. Why? Because when you don't have sun, guess what happens? Um, solar doesn't work. Now, this wasn't even the most amazing part of this of this these statistics. We're going to talk something about nameplate projections. What a nameplate um, a nameplate projection is when a device is created, and you see this on your refrigerator, you see it on your microwave. It says the amount of power. That it's going to do. This is what it's supposed to do. It's kind of like saying, well, we're going to guarantee that this is going to produce this much energy. Then what happens is you can run the device and then compare the nameplate uh, name projection to the actual amount of energy that you are having produced dependably. All right. So I mean, you see this on your you see this on your your microwave. It says it'll pr produce 1,100 watts of power, and that way, when you have something frozen, you can basically project how long it's going to take to actually unfreeze or or cook something. All right, that's what a nameplate projection. So let's take a look at the nameplate projections versus the amount of dependable energy that that device actually promotes. Now, when we look at gas, coal, and nuclear, they're at 100%. So the nameplate for, uh, let's say, a gas system is meant to produce 52,523 gigawatts at, in this case, in at a given time, in an hour or so. All right? The nameplate says these devices, these systems are going to produce 52,523. So basically the projection that the company is making about their product, about their systems is meeting 100% of what the companies are saying is dependable. So the coal systems, the gas systems, and the nuclear systems were all at 100% of their nameplate projections. That's a great thing, right? It, they're, they're very efficient. The systems do what they're told. Okay, so wind. Uh, the nameplate projection for wind is 28,755 gigawatts an hour. Um, what's it producing? 7,070. That's 25% of its nameplate projection. Wow. Solar, I kid you not. Before you stick those those awful hot solar panels on top of your on top of your roof, remember this: solar predicts forty eight hundred ninety eight gigawatts per hour. That is the um, nameplate projections. Solar actually produces three hundred and four gigawatts. That's six percent of its nameplate projection. Okay, now, I've given you numbers. I've given you numbers. And these numbers, these are off of the, uh, off of ECOT, 
All right, they're they're actually off of um, ERCOT. This is what they are saying is happening. Okay, on on the fifteenth, and what normally happens. So that's one area. And I'm sure people will say, well, that doesn't mean much because that's just that's just ERCOT in Texas. Well, yeah, okay. But I know when I drive through uh, Palm Springs, that has a huge uh, so, uh, wind farm with all of those gigantic windmills. Those damn things have, most of those things aren't even spinning. So if they're not spinning, they ain't producing anything. So I, I, I can believe the percentages. I believe them completely. So here's the thing. We should find alternative fuel sources. Oil is finite, and it's too valuable a resource to burn. It can be used for lubrications, for machinery, things like that. It shouldn't be burned in fuel. But here's the thing, and the government doesn't... People, idiots like AOC, you know, who's... For her... The bourbon she used to give to her customers had more fuel than she does in that freaking brain. I don't know what her story is. Let the private sector do it. The government sucks. It'll never fix anything. A lot of people say, well, they can't use nuclear because of what happened in Chernobyl, which was terrible, and Fujisama, which... I mean, come on, Fuji. There, there was a, there was a freaking tidal wave. I mean, you can't a tsunami. You can't really compare Fuji. Chernobyl is just that's what happens when the government runs nuclear. It blows up. The government can't do anything. Government standards, regulations, and their fear mongering are not going to fix any of the need to con to stop using oil and gas. And this will actually lead to people dying, dare I say. And people are dying. Look at what we've done with the electric car in the last few years. The last five years, we could not drive an electric car to the grocery store without the damn thing running out of juice. Now we can drive to Vegas on a single charge. What caused that? The government? The government did that? No, the government didn't do dick when it comes to that. The government did nothing that was private. The private sector is innovative. They create. They use science. The government doesn't. And private sector wants to be innovative. They want to be innovative because they want money. And that's how you get money. You become innovative. Look at Elon Musk. Right? In his car. Look at Toyota with the Prius. I think Prius is a crap car, but the Prius is the first widely bought electric or hybrid car. I don't want to say electric, it's not. Right now, the alternate energy ideas leftists want to push solar, wind, hydro, they're inefficient and they're expensive. And in the cases of, let's say, um, solar and wind, these devices actually hurt the environment. I mean, you've got the Sierra Club who's saying that we shouldn't have windmills because they're just decimating the bird population in these areas where they have these windmill farms. And it's the same thing with solar panels. Solar, solar panels, you think the solar panels actually just absorb the heat? They're not just absorbing the heat. They actually reflect the heat. Animals walk on those things or fly over them and poof, they burn up. Did you realize that your solar panels have to be specifically aimed away from other residences? Because those solar panels will reflect and actually crack glass. They run so hot. So, but we're, we're going in the right direction. So what we should do is let the free market take care of things. Don't put regulations on the free market. Don't put regulations on anything. Just let things go. The free market will innovate. It will make it that we don't have to use oil. It'll make it we don't have to use gas, though I don't see why natural gas is a thing anyway. I think it's a, a great source of uh, fuel. It's clean and it's easy to get. I don't know why we don't use nuclear, because it's clean, it's safe, and it's easy to get. I, I But that's what we're doing. 
So I, I that's what I think. I am not a, a climate denier. I think, yeah, it's probably getting warm, warmer. I think the climate changes. I think it changes all the time. I don't know. And I, I, I think that man probably does have something to do with it. I can't believe there are six, seven billion people on Earth and we're having nothing to do with the climate. Do I think we're all going to die in 10 years? Well, if we're going to die in 10 years, there's nothing really to worry. Nothing we can do about it anyway. Might as well skip it. Okay. Last story. I'm going to cover this one quick because I'm already over 30 minutes. Uh, the, this whole climate thing and this whole um, alternative energy thing and AOC being an idiot really made me go long. I'm not even going to get to talk about Joe Biden and his messed up... Uh, speech yesterday, a messed up uh, town hall yesterday with CNN. It was absolutely hysterical. But I think this story we, we've got to cover because I, I, I got a feeling Biden's going to say something hysterical all the time. So there's no reason to really kill myself talking about that. And I want to cut some video. Anyway, um, Republic, Republican Party looks like it's really in trouble. Uh, I, I thought for a second that the rise of Donald Trump would actually unite the Republican Party and would make it so that we've got a tougher group of people who are ready to lead in ways that will fight the left. And when I say fight, I don't mean beat up the left. I mean, will fight the left and their own little dirty t tricks would actually override their little dirty tricks. But I see that over the few months that Trump lost the election... And the Republicans just basically kowtowing to the Democrat, kowtowing to the Democrats and Joe Biden. Um, this could get real ugly. Well, President Trump released a uh, letter um, on the state of the party, and wow, did he unload on Mitch McConnell? And I, I'm not saying Mitch McConnell doesn't deserve this, because I got to tell you, people like Ben Sass, people like Mitch McConnell. Mitt Romney, all these people that are supposedly Republicans, they look like nothing but shills. They look like they're a bunch of grifters. They look like people who are just happy to be a senator, making all that money wherever it's going. And they don't seem to want to fight for anything. It's really disgusting. It really is. Well, Trump, uh, it was a rather long letter, but this one section really stood out. Let's read this. <coughs> quote, the Republican Party can never under again be respected or strong with political, quote, leaders, end quote, like Senator Mitch McConnell at its helm. McConnell's dedication to business as usual status quo policies, together with his lack of political insight, wisdom, skill, and personality, has rapidly driven him from the majority leader to the minority leader. And it will only get worse. The Democrats and Chuck Schumer will play McConnell like a fiddle. You've never had it so good. They've never had it so good. And they want it, want to keep it that way. We know our American First agenda is a winner, not McConnell's Beltway First agenda or Biden's America Last agenda. Um, okay. Wow. Uh, this is a, this, that was rough. It's not wrong. Um, I, I have to be honest, it's not wrong. I don't think it's wrong at all. I think he's probably got some really valid points in that whole thing. McConnell did not fight for Trump at all. Uh, a lot of the Republicans didn't fight for Trump at all. Why? Because joining Trump, and I, I Trump didn't help himself since he lost the election. I mean, Trump going out and saying the things he did, it didn't help. January 6th, even though I don't think January 6th was Trump's fault at all, I think that was just a bunch of ho yokels that are going out there and being idiots. And they're all going to jail now, so I don't see what the big deal is still. But Trump just didn't help himself. But I'm telling you, when McConnell made that speech after Donald Trump was acquitted from the impeachment trial, I thought, boy, McConnell just stepped on it. McConnell, of all people, should have known that this was a freaking farce. It was crap. And I understand he wasn't going to vote to impeach, to uh, convict Trump. But he should never have said what he said. Because this was not Trump's fault. Yes, his behavior wasn't great. He could have said that. But he laid into him on that speech right after. And you've got 
frickin' rhinos like Sass, uh, Sass and Romney that are just out there and all they care about is being senators. They don't care about... Well, Sass is gone anyway. He's retiring because he's probably going to get primaried in the next election. Who should be primary, primaried is Mitt Romney. And when I figure out who's running against him, you better bet he's getting a donation of $10 because I want that guy out of the frickin' office. Right now, the Republic, Republican Party does not look like it will split, but there seems to be two types of Republicans. There is the Republicans like Romney, the Republicans like John Roberts, the Su- Supreme Court justices, the Republicans like Mitch McConnell, and then there are the true conservatives like me, probably you, Donald Trump, Mike Pence, I think, is very conservative, even though he wasn't thrilled with Trump. He was pissed at Trump. I, If I were Mike Pence, that's the guy who deserves to be pissed at Trump because he basically cost Mike Pence his career. His political career is over, and Mike Pence has nothing been nothing but a Marine through this whole thing. But this idea of... I'd say Trump should just shut up and stay and be... it, But I don't think so because the left isn't shutting up and staying away. And we need Republicans like Trump to fight the left and what they're doing. Because what the left is doing is evil and they want to transform the country. And yes, I think communism, socialism, uh, cancel culture, I think all that's evil. I think it's pure evil. You can call me a racist, you can call me a bigot, a sexist, a misogynist, a xenophobe, whatever you want to call me, that doesn't make what I'm doing evil. But the fact that you someone calls me all that stuff just because they don't like what I say just tells me they don't have an opinion or they can't defend their own opinions. All right, so I ran a little bit long. Tomorrow we're going to talk about math and why it's racist and why this is absolutely going to kill this country. Okay, you can uh, follow me on um, Parlor at... Uh, Dumbasses Talking Politics. You can follow me at Twitter. Yeah, I'm going to mention it. At Run and Fool, R-U-N-N-I-N-F-E-W-L. You can download or listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Podcast Addict, Stitcher, and YouTube. And you can visit my website at www.dumbassestalkingpolitics.com. This is Gene, and you've listened to Dumbasses Talking Politics.